afternoon. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Carla Delaporta, and I am the Education and Development Coordinator here at Needy Meds. Needy Meds is a national nonprofit organization, and the face of our organization is our website. It is an informational resource, and through our website and toll free helpline, we connect patients to programs that provide financial assistance for healthcare expenses. We do have a special guest today who I will introduce shortly, but first I wanted to go over a few housekeeping rules. If you have questions, feel free to ask them at any time by typing them into the questions bar of your control panel and we will be happy to answer them at the end. For time constraint purposes, just keep in mind, we may not get to all of your questions, but rest assured we will follow up after the webinar via email if we weren't able to address them. This webinar will be recorded, and once it has been edited, you will be able to find it on the webinar library page of the Needy Meds website, and you'll also be able to find it on our YouTube page. Of course, at the end, we'll let you know our contact information so that you can follow up with myself or our special guest who's co-hosting the webinar today. And with that, I'd like to begin. Today's webinar is co-hosted by the National Osteoporosis Foundation. And today's topic is the National Osteoporosis, not Osteoporosis Foundation, Medications Available to Treat Osteoporosis. NFC NOS, or National Osteoporosis Foundation's clinical director, Dr. Andrea Singer, will discuss the recently released medicines in development for treatment of osteoporosis, osteoporosis report and provide information on current medications available for the treatment of osteoporosis. Now I'm going to take, take a moment to just give you a little background about our, our special guest, Dr. Andrea Singer. Dr. Singer is the Director of Women's Primary Care and Director of Bone Densitometry Department of, OB, excuse me, Department of OBGYN at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C., and she is a trustee and clinical director for the National Osteoporosis Foundation. So once again, we're thrilled to have Dr. Singer join us today, and I'm going to go ahead and switch the screen and pass the mic to her. Thank you and welcome, Dr. Singer. Please take over. Thanks, Carla, and it's a pleasure to be here today. So we're going to talk uh, briefly about osteoporosis and also existing medications that we have in the armamentarium as well as some new medications coming down the pike. What I'd like to first start with Um, it's just a word about the National Osteoporosis Foundation because we are the leading health organization dedicated to the prevention of osteoporosis and broken bones, the promotion of strong bones for life, and also dedicated to the reduction of human suffering through programs of public and clinician awareness, education, advocacy, and research. And when we finish, there will be some links available uh, information in case you would like more information or to contact the National Osteoporosis Foundation. I think it makes sense to start with a definition of osteoporosis, uh, which has been defined by an NIH consensus panel as a skeletal disorder characterized by compromised bone strength, which leads to or predisposes to an increased risk of fracture. When we talk about bone strength, what exactly do we mean? Well, bone st strength is made up of a number of different things, including the quantity or amount of bone that's there, which we generally measure by measuring bone mineral density. It's also made up of bone quality, which includes a number of different things, such as microarchitecture, or what the bone looks like and what its connections are like on the microscopic level. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words, and I think what you can see in the CT micrographs that are on this slide, you have an osteoporotic bone on the left and normal bone on the right. And it's not just the amount of bone that's there and the fact that there is less bone in the osteoporotic bone on the left, but it's also those connections, especially the horizontal trabeculae or struts 
that give bone its strength for all of the activities we do on a daily basis that are missing. And I think when looking at the osteoporotic bone, it's not difficult to understand why someone with osteoporosis would be at increased risk for breaking a bone. So how important is this? And I think we have to start with the prevalence of osteoporosis and low bone mass. If we look at the slide and we look at the data from 2010 and the 2010 census, 54 million Americans okay, out of 99 million who are 50 years of age or older have either osteoporosis or low bone mass, which places them at increased risk for fracture. That 17% of the entire U.S. population and those numbers are only expected to increase with a projected 27% increase from 2010 to 2030. So whether or not we want to think about this as providers as well as citizens who are aging, this is something that's real and that we're going to need to think about. This slide shows Cast Mountain, um, which I realize it's not as easy as sort of the uh, you know, pink ribbon or something that we can put on our lapel. But Cast Mountain represents just one day of fractures caused by osteoporosis in the United States. And it's about 12 feet high and 12 feet wide, weighs a, a lot of pounds. Um, the point is that every day there are a significant number of fractures, and every year there are 2 million bone breaks in this country that are signs of and due to osteoporosis. So again, overwhelming numbers when you start to think about the impact of osteoporosis and fractures. It's hard to, again, go beyond without thinking about the human and financial impact. Half of women and about a quarter of men over the age of 50 will break a bone due to osteoporosis in their lifetime. Despite this, after a fracture, only, only one out of five women gets tested or treated for osteoporosis meaning that four out of five women do not even get evaluated. Every year of the nearly 300,000 hip fracture patients that there are, and we'll look at this again more specifically in a moment, but a significant number end up in nursing homes or are never able to function at the level or prior to their hip fracture. And osteoporosis and osteoporotic fractures are costly. Now the estimate is about $19 billion per year, but by 2025, uh, that is projected to increase to about $25 billion per year. And importantly, there's a care gap in this country because we're not diagnosing and treating patients once they have a fracture, even though we know that that is a sign or a sentinel event, and we should recognize that osteoporosis may be the cause. People often think about um, diseases for over which they worry, and when you ask patients in general and women specifically, what they worry about or what is most common, what often comes to mind are things like heart attacks, breast cancer, and stroke. This was a study that was done looking at the percent of hospitalizations for common serious diseases in older U.S. women. And the graph shows the relationship between the number of total osteoporotic fractures, myocardial infarction, which is heart attack, stroke and breast cancer over a 12-year period. And by far, there were more osteoporotic fractures that required hospitalization than those other illnesses. 43% uh, of all hospitalizations were due to osteoporotic fractures. And if we look at the age group 75 years of age and older, osteoporotic fractures accounted for 50% of hospitalizations. So again, it is not to belittle those other conditions. I am a pr primary care physician. I understand the importance and certainly screen my patients for risk factors for those. The message here is that osteoporotic fractures are important and lead to a significant burden of illness in this country. I mentioned earlier the issues surrounding hip fractures because we often think about hip fractures as the worst kind of fracture. Uh, I would emphasize that spine fractures and other non-vertebral fractures can lead to significant changes in one's life, inability to do things and get around as well. But if we focus on hip fractures for a moment, there are 300,000 hip fractures in this country every year, 
out of those 300,000, somewhere between 20 and 25% of patients die within the first year following a hip fracture, and that greater risk of dying persists for at least five years. About a quarter end up in a nursing home, and about half never regain their previous function. So fractures can be life-altering or life-changing events. Now, half of hip fracture patients give us advance notice, meaning that 50% of patients with a hip fracture had a prior osteoporotic fracture, which, if recognized, is an obvious opportunity for intervention. And so we want to make sure that people are aware that if they break a bone, they should make sure their physician or healthcare provider is aware so that they can discuss appropriate evaluation and appropriate treatment. So with that as background, let's move on to talk about medication for the treatment of osteoporosis. Before we can talk about the specific medications that are out there, I think we need to understand how they would work. And that means that we need to first address the bone remodeling cycle. Bone is a living, growing tissue that constantly repairs and forms new bone. Uh, it renews and changes throughout life through a process called remodeling. And what's shown here on this slide is a representation of the bone remodeling cycle. At the top, you have the resting phase, okay, where bone cells line the surface. Then with activation of osteoclasts, so differentiation, activation, and their migration to the bone surface, osteoclasts, which are often referred to as the bone resorbing cells, begin to resorb bone and continue to do so so that they form what you can see there as a little cavity or a resorption pit. After a certain amount of time, those bone cells stop working or may die a programmed cell death. We move to the reversal stage, and then osteoblasts or the bone forming cells migrate to that resorption pit they start to lay down collagen and mineral deposits, essentially forming new bone that fills those resorption pits. And then the cycle starts over again. Different parts of the, our bones in the body are at different places in this remodeling cycle at any given time, but this occurs throughout life. Now, in younger people and in premenopausal women, those processes of bone breakdown and bone formation are generally matched. So that we have remodeling to repair micro damage, to keep bone strong, but we don't lose any bone. After menopause with the decline in estrogen, in certain other medical conditions, as we age, and sometimes with certain other medications that we take for other medical problems, those processes are no longer matched and there's greater resorption or bone breakdown then there is bone formation. That can lead to a net loss of bone and ultimately to osteoporosis and that increased risk for fracture. So as we start to talk about medications, you can see different places in this remodeling cycle or imagine where medications might work, perhaps to slow bone resorption or to enhance or increase bone formation. And indeed, there are two major categories of medications anti-resorptive medications that essentially slow bone loss, and anabolic or bone-forming drugs that essentially increase bone formation. This slide shows where the current medications that we have in the armamentarium fall in terms of their mechanism of action. So let's look at the right side of the slide first because that one is briefer. If we look at the anabolic or bone building drugs that we currently have approved, there is only one that's approved in the United States, and that is parathyroid hormone. Again, the way that parathyroid hormone works is to essentially, and I'll show you this in another slide in a moment, but stimulate the bone building cells and lead to new bone formation. On the left-hand side of the slide, you see a longer list of anti-resorptive medications who work primarily by inhibiting bone resorption. And those include hormone therapy, so estrogen or estrogen and progesterone agents in combination, 
what we some people will refer to as a CIRM or selective estrogen receptor modulator or is often today called an estrogen agonist antagonist and the one in the US that is approved is raloxifene its brand name is Avista we'll talk individually about these medications uh, more in a moment there is another class of medication a TSEC or tissue specific estrogen complex which is a combination of estrogen and a CIRM, calcitonin, the category of bisphosphonates, and we'll look at those in a moment, and then a separate category of rank ligand inhibitor for which there is one called denosumab. So if we think about the anti-resorptive medications, they work in a number of ways to ultimately reduce fracture risk. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're most interested in, is does a medication reduce the risk for fracture at the sites over which we are most concerned? Antiresorptives decrease bone turnover. Again, that's sort of implicit in their name by decreasing resorption. They're going to decrease bone breakdown or turnover. They sometimes, and to varying degrees, can increase bone mineral density although certainly to smaller amounts than our bone building drug. They improve the microstructure or microarchitecture of drugs, of, of bone rather, so that they help with those connections uh, that give bone its strength. And by all of these mechanisms, they decrease fracture risk, which again is really what we're most interested in. On the opposite side, Parathyroid hormone, or the one anabolic drug that we have, works by decreasing the programmed cell death of osteoblasts, or the bone-forming cells. It stimulates differentiation of bone lining cells and precursors to osteoblasts so that there are more osteoblasts or bone-forming cells formed, and they're able to act for a longer duration so that more bone is formed. So again, both classes of drugs work at a microarchitectural level to improve the structure of bone. They can improve bone density, although the anabolic drugs, that's the primary way they work and do so to a greater degree. But both classes decrease fractures or broken bones, and that's our ultimate goal. This is a little bit of a busy table, uh, which has a lot of information in it, but it shows you the classes of and specific currently FDA-approved medications. I mentioned estrogen and the combination of estrogen and basodoxaphene. Those are medications that are technically approved for the prevention of osteoporosis. The other medications in the list, uh, some are approved for prevention, but they are approved primarily for treatment of osteoporosis. What I'd like you to look at as we go down the slide um, is the differences in indications. PMO stands for postmenopausal osteoporosis. That is obviously in women. Some of the medications are also indicated for the treatment of men, and that's listed as male. And GIOP is glucocorticoid or steroid-induced osteoporosis. So some of these medications are indicated for a number of different uses in different populations. The grouping in the middle, alendronate, residronate, abandronate, and zoledronic acid, those are the medications that we commonly know as bisphosphonates. And you may be more familiar with some of their trade names in terms of Fosamax, Actinel, Boniva and Reclast. Denosumab uh, is the rank ligand inhibitor that I mentioned. It is branded as Prolia. It's a twice a year injection. And then Teriparatide or Forteo, which is at the bottom of your table, is the one bone building or anabolic drug that we have. The other information that I would draw your attention to is the fact that these medications come in multiple different types of formulations and regimens. So some are in pill form, given orally. They can be daily, once a week or once a month. Some are parenteral or injectable in terms of their route of administration. And that can be four times a year, twice a year, or an intravenous infusion once a year. And there's also a nasal spray. 
Uh, and then teriparatide or Forteo is given as a daily injection by the patient at home. The idea being that there are lots of options in the armamentarium so that hopefully a patient can work with his or her healthcare provider to find a medication that is best for the patient based on one's medical history, prior fracture, or maybe not having had a prior fracture, other medical conditions, other medications they may take, preferred routes of administration or dosing regimens. There are many options so that we hopefully can get those people who need to be treated, treated appropriately. One way sometimes to distinguish medications is to look at clinical trial data that we have, especially data that comes from RCTs or randomized control trials, and look at where we have information about fracture reduction. In order for an osteoporosis medication to be approved by the FDA, it has had to show that it reduces vertebral fractures or fractures of the spine. And so you can see in the column next to all of these medications that they have shown vertebral or spine fracture reduction. Where they may differ a little bit is in whether or not in clinical trials they have shown reduction in hip and or non-vertebral, non-spine fractures. Fractures like the wrist, the humerus or, or shoulder area, um, thigh bone or, or femur or pelvis, including some other sites as well. And so some of our medications have data to show that they reduce fractures across all of these sites. Others, at least in the clinical trials, did not demonstrate an effect at either hip or non-vertebral sites. So that may be a way that a healthcare provider makes a decision in terms of thinking about initial therapy. Again, it's a complex decision-making process which is based not only on the effects of the drugs, but also the individual patient and his or her needs. So that's what we have existing today. What do we have coming down the pike? Are, is our future bright? And what are we looking forward to? So in March, the National Osteoporosis Foundation and Pharma released a medicines and development report which spoke about new innovative therapies that are currently being developed for the treatment of osteoporosis. And this report, you can see the front page of it here on the screen, examines the nationwide effects of the disease, so some of what I've reviewed with you today in terms of the impact of osteoporosis and broken bones, and also explores how new medications can improve and save lives. I think today we have a better understanding of the causes and impact of osteoporosis than we've ever had before, and we also understand some of the pathways that are responsible for both normal development and remodeling of bone, and what goes awry when we lose bone abnormally in osteoporosis forms. So that it's critical that we put our knowledge to work to develop additional scientific enhancements in both detecting osteoporosis, but also in treating osteoporosis so that we can really bring an end to suffering from fractures and this debilitating condition. And so as we think about some of the new medications that we have out there, it's really based on some of the developments in the area and new insights into bone biology that have led to the development of some of these new medications. So I want to talk about sort of three classes of medications um, that are new and are in development. The first is a cathepsin K inhibitor. This is an oral medication that inhibits the primary enzyme on osteoclasts. Remember, osteoclasts are those, those bone cells that break down bone. Um, and this is the enzyme that digests protein during bone resorption. So if we inhibit that enzyme, what would follow is that the proteins in the bone would not be able to be digested or broken down. Interestingly, although the enzyme is inhibited, the osteoclast is not destroyed, so that it is still able to secrete signaling factors that actually stimulate osteoblasts or the cells that form bone. Because as I mentioned earlier, normally these processes are linked, and so osteoclasts and osteoblasts speak to each other to keep those processes coupled. 
So this allows that signaling to still go on, but not as much bone to be lost. So that's one new category uh, of drug with a new mechanism of action. The next new group looks at development of a monoclonal antibody to sclerostin. And sclerostin is a protein that has anti-anabolic effects on bone formation, meaning that when sclerostin is around, it can inhibit new bone formation. By making a monoclonal antibody that binds to and inhibits the action of sclerostin, a new medication can play a critical role in increasing bone formation because sclerostin would not be free to inhibit formation and thereby you have more bone formation and less bone breakdown. So again, a new, another new exciting class or approach to treating osteoporosis. And finally, the last class that I want to touch in on is that of a synthetic analog of human parathyroid hormone-related protein, or what we tend to abbreviate as PTHRP. Again, this is a drug that promotes new bone formation without causing too much calcium in the blood and without causing significant bone resorption. So if we think about the one bone-building drug that we currently have, teriparatide or Forteo, this is similar in some senses, um, but seems to cause less hypercalcemia or increase in calcium levels in, in the blood. If we look at just a partial list of what is out there or what is coming down the pike, this lists some medicines that are in development, abaloparatide being the synthetic peptide analog of human parathyroid hormone-related protein, Adonicata being the cathepsin K inhibitor class that I spoke about, and romazosumab being the sclerostin uh, protein inhibitor or a monoclonal antibody to sclerostin. Prolia, I mentioned, is already available, but sometimes we have either new uses for medications being investigated or new formulations, as with uh, Tibria, looking at an oral formulation of calcitonin as opposed to the nasal spray, and sometimes new delivery routes, again, uh, that may afford us other options in the future. If you're interested in reading more and seeing the full medicines and development report and a list of medications, uh, I've listed the website for you here. So you can go to the NOF Dot org page and then type in the rest of this uh, in terms of the call line and that will take you to the medicines and development report. And if you need additional information about osteoporosis in general, whether it be prevention, diagnosis, or treatment, either as a patient or as a provider, please visit the NOF website at www.nof.org. So with that, uh, I will leave the last page up for that contact information. But that's the end of the formal presentation. And as Carla mentioned, I think we're happy to take a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Singer. We were so happy to have you on board and to take what could sometimes be a complicated diagnosis, especially the treatment of which with all of the medications available out there, and bring us up to speed on recent developments and explain really what the options are out there. In particular, for me, at the very beginning of the webinar, the visuals that you used, including, including the osteoporotic bone visual, the graph showing the per the percentage of people uh, diagnosed with osteoporosis in our country, and certainly the cast mountain really drove the impact of this in our society home. I was thrilled to hear um, of the lengthy list of medications, but even more excited to learn that we've your um, your field of research and expertise has come such a long way in not only the understanding and detecting of this diagnosis, but it certainly does seem that there's reason to be hopeful when it comes with new treatment options down the pike. So thank Absolutely. you so much. I, I think the future is bright. Um, I think we have learned a great deal and continue to do so. And you know, we want to make sure that we can really do the best we can for patients in treating this debilitating disease. That's right. What I wanted to do is just take a brief moment to point, point out 
just a couple of things on the Needy Meds website. First of all, Dr. Singer again addressed a number of drugs and medications for people that have been diagnosed. I want to point out on the Needy Meds homepage, in the very top left hand section of your screen, you see a simple drug search box. All you have to do to find out whether or not there is a prescription assistance program available, meaning a program available for help you, to help you get medications you might need for the diagnosis of osteoporosis at a cheaper or more affordable rate, you simply type in the drug name in that field and it will automatically let you know whether or not there is a program available out there. Of course, if you don't have often or easy access to the internet, we certainly direct you to call the counselors on our toll-free helpline, which is right if they're on your screen at 1-800-503-6897, they're available Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, with any of your questions. One other, one other quick resource I'd like to point out is under the Patient Savings tab in the center, you'll see a hyperlink to Diagnosis Information Pages. And if you scroll down to Osteoporosis, you will see a link that you, once you click on it, it'll bring you to a diagnosis page for osteoporosis. And as you can see, we partner with the National Osteoporosis Foundation to keep this page updated and accurate. And what I'd like to point out most importantly is at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a list of medications commonly used in the treatment of this diagnosis. Now, based on this, uh, this webinar and the information Dr. Singer provided, it looks like we'll be doing sub-updates of this medication list. But in the meantime, I wanted to point it out to you, and you'll notice all of those drugs at the bottom of your screen are hyperlinked, meaning that you click on them and our website will do the work for you of finding, finding out whether there's a patient savings program for you to get the medication at a more affordable rate. The only other thing I'd like to take the time to point out, just bear with me one moment. As promised, I wanted to make sure we left you today, excuse me, <laughs> with our contact information should you like to get in touch with me or find out some further information directly from the National Osteoporosis Foundation. I also want to take a moment to remind you that you can type in questions right now on the questions panel of your, your control panel, and we'll be happy to answer them. Again, if we don't get to all of them, you can expect us to follow up via email. So Dr. Singer, I'm just going to review a few um, of the of the questions that we have. Some of these I can answer, um, whether or not you will have access to these slides and the presentation. Yes, we will here at Needy Meds, we will put this webinar up on our webinars library page. It will also be on our YouTube page. And if you like, we can email you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. It looks like we do have some questions regarding people taking particular or specific medications because they have been diagnosed with osteoporosis. Since we do have a number of those questions and they are specific to that individual, what I recommend you're doing is calling the counselors on our 800 number that is available on our website and they will able to be able to help you with your particular situation. And of course, if they're not able to, they will refer you to hopefully a resource that can. It doesn't look like this afternoon, Dr. Singer, any more questions for you or I are coming in. I want to okay. again thank you so much for the time, for your time today. It was really quite an edu education and we really do appreciate your taking the time to share your afternoon with us. Oh, my pleasure, thanks for having me. Thank you and thank you everyone for joining us. We'll be in touch.